You got some, you got caught up on your work a little bit, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, good. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And I know I told uh, Keisha maybe Thursday I sent her something saying the girls would be here. And she said, wonderful. <laughs> the girls will be glad that they're going to be here. So, anyway, uh, that's, we're glad you're here. So, that's great. Any uh, other announcements? I haven't read these ones. You have any other announcements today that aren't here? Look at there's that many here. We'll be, announcements. Down, we'll be down here Thursday evening and Friday evening setting up for the rummage sale. And then the sale is Saturday from 10 to 3. And, I, the, and the rummage sale is for missions. For missions. Yeah, yeah. For missions. I figured that I was. I knew we were going to do it on Thursday night to set up and Friday maybe also and then Saturday. But uh, I was sitting here Thursday. I don't know, you, I probably none of you do this, but about uh, 8 o'clock I said, <laughs> I missed it. <laughs> I'm a slacker right now. I missed it. They're all over there loading everything. I said, no, it's next week. <laughs> I didn't miss it. So, so you guys don't miss it. It's the 26th, okay? Thursday or Friday night to set up. At what time? What time, Kathy? Price says, price says, but. Uh, it doesn't say. We'll, pro we'll probably get down here about 6.30 or so. And if you don't, if you have some stuff that you can bring down and stick in the sale, it'd be great. And if you don't, wait till a neighbor leaves their garage door open when they leave the house. <laughs> I would get some good it. stuff. There's a lot of that going on already. <laughs> <laughs> Not for missions, I don't think. It's, it's a, it's well, a, I'm sorry, the superintendent's here. I yeah, didn't even say that. That's a, that's a self-identified mission here. So on the uh, 25th, there's going to well, 26, I guess it's the same. Uh, there's a two, that's ongoing, a 2 p.m. time of prayer, and Adam and, and Mandy have been doing that or meeting for that. And that is something you could do if you had, had the time or you weren't doing anything, stop by and pray for the needs of the church. Pray for yourself, pray for your neighbors. Uh, whatever, whatever it takes, that's a ministry that uh, is, is here now. Uh, we have, of course, opportunities to give to... Uh, Nazarene Compassion Ministries, which we usually have opportunities to get yearly, but specifically for the, uh, the hurricanes that took place. We'd ask that uh, you consider being a part of that as well, if the Lord's blessed you and you, you have a way to, uh, to give to that, give to that. Um, again, I ask if there's any other announcements. I don't really see any, which is, we will probably be filling up our calendar with Thanksgiving type stuff and, and so on. We did meet with the district superintendent for our annual review. It was not annual, it's a quadrennial, it's four year review. And basically, uh, the church board met and the church board participated in it because they fill out a form, they give in the information you need to know how to go forward. But really, we're doing is basically, uh, I'll, I'll just leave it here because he might even be preaching on it today, but just casting a vision uh, and not casting it right away, just. You know, kind of steeping it in prayer Amen. as to what we might do. And a lot of it's really, a lot of things we could be doing are probably of the cup of cold water type, very simple. Mm -hmm. Breaking bread, uh, talking to each other, those type of things we enjoy doing already. Mm -hmm. And so it might be, uh, might, might organically grow or spiritually grow into something mm -hmm. that is a little more uh, complicated. It might take a little more time and a little more prayer. But anyway, be thinking in, in, be in prayer. Uh, I, I think a lot of times that uh, when I think of prayer, I think what I'm asking God, and then a lot of prayer is a conversation. It's like when the district superintendent encourages us to, in this season, to not run out and try to demand the barricades and to, uh, you know, engage the enemy uh, and listen, get, you know, get armed first for the battle and uh and then and then go out and so we're not trying to turn everything on its head or get make make busy work so we can feel like we're spiritual we're just looking for what the lord would have us do and you're part of that and that's what the district superintendent also told us and they always do uh that this is not a job just for ministers and training or for uh the 
ministers. This is a, a ministry of believers. Amen. It's a ministry of believers. And you've each been gifted and have something to give. And it's not less and it's not more than anybody else's. It's perfectly yes. given. It's perfectly designed because God put it in your life. Yes. And that weapon that we have, uh, it, it will succeed. Mm -hmm. and, and nothing can harm it or dispel it. So let's just claim that promise as you move forward. Amen. The, well, we always do this here. I don't know why, but it, this is something that I think if I stop, it'd be the one thing you'd notice. Any birthdays or anniversaries? <laughs> I mean, not that they don't notice the rest of it, but this, this, would, this would be something. Do we have any birthdays or anniversaries today? Uh, he next has week. his next Sunday, <laughs> next Sunday, but since his weekends are unpredictable, he's here no, today. No, come on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you might have to, yeah, that, that apple crop might, you know. <laughs> the yeah, pool, no. you know. <laughs> next week. Oh, next week. Next week. You yeah. are. <laughs> All right. Next week, now we all know it though, see? So next week we're singing happy, happy birthday to you. <laughs> There's a, he has a, uh, I don't know, it's not, the, I'm not going to go into detail, but see, we're talking about miracles. His paperwork, he had to actually return to Mexico, and he had, that's his wife, mm -hmm. and those girls back there, there's children back there, I don't see the third, but she's somewhere, but anyway, oh, there she is back there. Uh, my daughter, granddaughter. And, this could have not ended. <laughs> it could have ended badly. His name was a little different on one document than another, and that could keep you down there for the rest of your life, I guess. It's kind of like here in the Social Security Administration. I mean, if something's not quite right, you're, you're going to get it right, or they're not going to do whatever they would normally do for you. But anyway, long story short, they were back in a flash. Probably didn't seem like a flash. How long was it? It was three months. Three, yeah, back back in, in that all, yeah, it wasn't a flash, but it was a flash compared to what it could have been. Right. Yes. And so the Lord really made it possible for them to be here and not all of them have to go back and, you know, whatever. Yeah. Or take two separate residence, residences or whatever. So we want to praise the Lord for that. There's a lot of things the Lord's doing. Lord Jesus, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your presence with us the way you guide and direct us, that you uh, nudge us along, that sometimes on that highway of holiness we find ourselves uh, in the ditch, but you, you pick us up, dust us off, and get us on, and we keep moving towards that heavenly prize. And, and, and as we do that, we also look around to see who we might be able to bring along with us, who that might falter that we can, we can be a support to, them. we can offer comfort to those on the journey. We're all, we're all pilgrims. Lord, we think, we think about uh, your love for us, the love that passes our understanding, and yet you've asked us to love one another. And in doing so, we actually love others as well, because love is something that is not very plentiful, or not on display in our culture in the way it should be. And when it is, you're lifted up. We ask you to anoint the word today, and that it be a word that penetrates our hearts and our lives, it makes us more like you. And as you do that, we'll continue to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. Uh, we echo the phrase of many, 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 many pilgrims throughout the years, and particularly when Jesus said to Peter, will you leave me too? He says, well, where would I go? Where would we go? You have the words of truth. Thank you, Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name.
as love, fast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood, and the prince of life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. into the fire. Mm. And so the whole time I was praying for him while he was gone, I'm going, get behind the truck! Get behind the truck! <laughs> the army guys never go in front of the tank. They go behind the tank. And so your illustration served very well. I was pretty vivid in my mind to think that Adam's out there. And so then I tell him that last night. And he goes, yeah, and these are the pants. They had to spray the cuffs because they caught on fire. We all need Jesus, don't we? <laughs> Heavenly Father, we pray your blessing upon those who can give today and the offerings that we give to you. We pray that you'll allow us to just um, function without restraint because we don't worry about the, the monies. The money will come and you'll send it and we just pray that you'll speak to people's hearts and that the offering will go to things that we don't even know about, that to meet the need, to be there. We thank you. And uh, even this morning, to remember we're a small church, we can turn on a dime and meet the needs that come ahead. The Father, bless the giver and those who cannot. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
sweet the sound the same the wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found was blind but now I see twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are gone I've been set
told of again To hear you say that I'm your friend You are my desire No one else will do Cause nothing else can take your place Feel the warmth of your embrace Help me find a way Bring me back to you it's a new day that God has given me it can be for you too all you have to do is reach out and give you already been on an adventure you know what I'm talking about don't you let the Lord lead your steps and your way and take you there where you need to go don't be bored let the joy of the Lord be your strength thank you Summer for giving us that joy that we can share because we're part of you we're part of you let's pray Heavenly Father we thank you today for your great love for us and that you, you constantly are there for us to guide and lead us and take us where you want us to go. And Father, forgive us for the times that we're discouraged, for the times that we don't see the promise in tomorrow. The sun's going to shine and the rain's going to fall, but you're going to be with us through it all. We just pray your guidance and direction in our church as we come into this time of awareness and of looking into the future. Would you allow us to do maybe things we've never done before, but let it be an adventure. My goodness, it isn't going to be forever. It's, it's for now. So we pray your blessing upon us now as we, as we grow, as we open up, as we allow you. Father, if those are sick, let them know from example that you can heal them. You can touch their lives and you can see uh, their lives bloom. And I thank you for the years in my life that the locusts have destroyed. That You're going to give it back. Amen. I believe it. Amen. And for each and every one of us. I remember what Angus said, Don, I, I, sense, I sense it. I feel it. And the Lord, you can move us. All we have to do is open our eyes because you're always as near as we want to be, as we want you to be. And we draw near to you today. Yes. Guide and direct touch and heal those people and let them know that it's because of you that they are healed and they can glorify you. And other people would come into the knowledge of there is a God that heals? Yes. There is a God that helps my family and directs my life? Yes. Father, continue to watch over us Continue to help us to love better each and every day until we see you, you return. Now, Father, we pray for our superintendent as he gives the message to us. May it be a message that stirs our hearts, that brings us and Amen. changes the very nature the, of our hearts. Father, we thank you today. We pray your blessing. And for those requests that, that aren't aired here, I lump them on the altar here because you know them. 
And we pray your blessing now in Jesus' name. And the people said, Amen. 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 You may be seated. It is good to have Adam back from the burning flame. And man, oh man, be happy. Shall we introduce him? the rip roaring, long haired, drum playing superintendent from our district? Pastor Dave Mowry. Watch those girls as they go. Sometimes they make faces at you. There you go. Thank you. Appreciate that. Well, I can only form it up so much. That's, that's good. You tried your best. <laughs> Appreciate that. John, you want to? Is my lapel light working all right? Can you hear me okay? Yes? Yeah. It is so good to be with you today. Uh, uh, my wife, Melissa, would like to be here uh, with me. She has a couple of things going on. She's um, been struggling with some back nerve pain in her uh, lower sacrum, and she's had major surgery for that. She's still recovering from that. Um, and so uh, she wishes she could be here riding in the car that long is difficult uh, for her. Uh, but the other thing is, is we flew her over to Seattle for, uh, uh, to be with some, some family for an event over there. But she was like, oh my goodness, I really wanted to be at Trinity. And uh, so she wanted me to, to bring you her greetings. Um, you ever met somebody and you're like, oh, they're a nice person. Then you meet their spouse and you're like, oh, wow, you know, there's a lot more to this person than I thought. If you met my wife, you'd be like, oh, wow, there's more to Dave than you thought. <laughs> she kind of brings me up. So she, I, I miss her presence. Uh, she's truly a gift uh, to me, but also... Uh, just to, to the world around her, God just shines through her. So I, I miss her, and I'm, I'm sorry. She's sorry she couldn't be here today. Uh, I also want to just acknowledge that we had a board meeting last night. And, uh, you know, as uh, church, what we talked about last night is churches go through seasons. And uh, sometimes it feels like, man, uh, there's a harvest going on. You know, just everything's going so great. And there's people coming to the Lord and baptisms. And there's kids running around. And there's just all this flurry of activity. And then you go through some seasons where it's not like that. It feels like winter. It's cold. And it feels like, man, there's just not as much, you know, fruit uh, blooming everywhere. And we just acknowledge that right now it feels kind of like Trinity is in one of those seasons where we're evaluating what season we're in. And I just appreciate the work of your board and your pastors because they are taking a long and good, solid look at the season in the life of this church and knowing, is God at work in every season or only in the harvest? Every season. I had a, a good friend who was a farmer, and his name was John. And I said, John, what do you do, you know, when it's not harvest? And he's like, oh my goodness, there's so much work to be done. <laughs> I mean, there's so much work to be done in every season. So I would just encourage you, uh, and we made a list of all the ways that we saw God at work in the life of the church. And it was profoundly amazing what God is doing in this church and around this church, God is truly doing some wonderful things. I, um, as superintendent, some of you may not know what a superintendent is. Uh, a, a superintendent of churches is similar to a superintendent of schools. So I oversee a group of churches. There are 73 churches on the Northwest District that I oversee. I am the, the, the overseer for that. That does not mean that I micromanage and control every single church. I just get involved when churches need me or when it's important. And so the review process is a part of that work. Every four years I visit and, and we, we uh, check on churches and do a little bit more in depth. So this was a, a good meeting last night, especially as we dreamed into the future. It was really encouraging. I, uh, I do want to just point out that, uh, you know, we were talking about the season in the life of a, of a church. But I would guess that each and every one of us notice that there's the America, or the world, around us, is in a season itself. Uh, it's a political season. 
right? Anybody notice that? That there's people screaming online and on our screens about who you should vote for and who you should donate money to and, and all of that. But I would say uh, that we're in the midst of a season in the church in the United States. And would you say that it's a great harvest? Yes. It depends. I, uh, I come to Yakima on a, on a semi-regular basis to, because there's multiple Nazarene churches here. And there's a little coffee shop I found in town called Catalyst. Maybe you've heard of it, but it was over here in a vineyard church, right downtown. And uh, so I got to know, I just, they don't know me. I just knew that they were a part of the church, and, and they, I knew that they were, um, they were Christians who were running this coffee shop, and it was sort of loosely affiliated with the church. So I, you know, this morning, I was going to go to Catalyst, because that's, I, I want to go support that, and I love coffee, and I love good coffee. Anyway, so... So I show up and I notice that the church is all boarded up. I don't know if you've been by there, but it's completely boarded up. All the windows around the first two levels have plywood in all the windows. And I thought, wow, well, you know, number one, I was sad. And I thought, is my coffee shop still there? And so I came around the corner and it said, we are moving. And, and it's next to the coffee shop's moving next week. And so I, I was the first one there when they opened up at 8.30 because I needed to be here for church at 9. And uh, I walked in and, and I said, oh, I said, I see you're moving. And she said, yeah, yeah, we had to, to move. And I said, we're, I said did, did, did something go on with the church? And I'm, I'm not kidding. Uh, the owner, Elena, just instantly almost broke into tears. You know, there was a, she said, yeah, the church didn't make it. We were a part of that um, church. We were, she goes, I, I, I has, we were members there, I think. I mean, there was just, the, there was just like, you could just tell there was a deeper story going on in Elena's life as she wrestled with the fact that that church was not making it. I said, is the church still gathering? She said, well, they're over at the YMCA, but I don't know if it's going to make it. Well, now, what Elena is dealing with is what every church is dealing with, for the most part, is the culture around us in the United States is no longer friendly to Christianity. There is something that has changed in the culture. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to go out and say, like, well, it used to be all perfect. It used to be all great, because <laughs> there's always been challenges. But I will say this, that something in the culture has shifted, and we all know it. We look around, people don't really want to come to church anymore. I, there have been times when this church has been filled with people, am I right? Packed out with people, and now we look around, and, and honestly, we look around and we go, where is everybody? Why don't people want to hear about Jesus anymore? Something has shifted. Something has changed. It's a different. There's a season that has shifted, not just in this church, but there is a season in our culture that makes us think uh, something is different. Something has changed. And I, you know, I'm a I'm a church leader. I'm a pastor, and I've been a pastor for 32 years now, and not as long as you're pastors, but I'm getting there. I'm catching up. And as a pastor, it's been on my watch while I've been a pastor that there has been decline. And I'll tell you, that bothers me. Pastors, did you agree? That bother, that bother anybody, any other pastors in the room? Like, I always went on my watch and things got better. On my watch, God, we grew the church, right? That's what, Amen. yeah. And God has been uh, working on me because I want to take control. And I want to say, all right, well, we're going to wrestle this to the ground. And we're going to go out there and we're going to, you know, <laughs> what are all the slogans? We're going to storm the gates of hell. We're going to get out of there. We're going to, you know what I mean? It's like, we're going to make it bigger. We're going to make it better. And 
God has been really doing a work in me to think about what season that we're in. Because I have doubted the plan. God, what is your plan in all this? Where are you in all this? Your, what your church is experiencing is what a lot of churches are experiencing. Is that okay? I, I think we're all wrestling with that. And, and if you're like me, you, sometimes you go home at night and you say, well, what are you up to, God? Aren't you going to fix this? What am I missing? What have I done wrong? I just want to let you know that if you have some of those deep feelings that I have on this subject, we're in really good company. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. I just invite you to open up your Bibles to that. I think it would be good if you brought your Bible or you've got the Bible app on your phone. Just open that sucker up. You're going you're gonna to want to just sort of dwell on this just for a few minutes. And I want you to really feel the tension of this moment. The disciples have been following Jesus for three years. Jesus has uh, led them. He's taught them. They've done, he's done miracles. He's done miracles through his disciples. And there was this great buildup to coming into Jerusalem. And the disciples are like, yes! We are making it big. Jesus has fed thousands. He's a household name around here. He's got a reputation. Like we are finally going to be great, and, and we're you know eventually we're going to get the Roman government out of here. Like here we go. And then Jesus is crucified. And I tell you what, you talk about disappointment. They are devastated, and they scatter, and Peter, den you know, denies Christ, and they, they don't know what to, their whole world is just flipped upside down. They're dealing with deep disappointment that the success that they had all banked on was not happening. And here we come to the, to the end. Now Jesus is resurrected. And I, if you're like me, it's like, okay, all right, here we go. Jesus is alive. Uh, you know, but we're going to turn this thing around. Maybe this is, you know, if he's alive, now we can go show Pilate, show the Pharisees, and show everybody like, hey, Jesus is boss. He's alive. He's going to, now we can make him king, right? We can do this thing. And Jesus says, hey, meet me up on that mountain. And he's acting like he's going to leave. And this is the point. This is where we're at. Matthew 28, verse 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some of them, what's that word? Say it with me. Some of them doubted. Some of them doubted? And that just shocks me. Some of them doubted. And then Jesus came to them. And this is what he said. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Aren't you glad? Amen. 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 Some of them doubted. I, it's amazing to me the contrast because some they, they worshipped him. It says they all worshipped him. I, I mean, they saw him crucified they, and now he's resurrected standing in front of them. So it's like, okay, he's obviously God. He's obviously the Messiah. He's obviously everything he ever said he would be. He is it. So they were in awe. They were just worshipping him in awe. But they, at the same time, they were conflicted because 
This plan is terrible. Anybody else agree? This is a terrible plan. Jesus is acting like he's leaving. He was publicly humiliated. I mean, do you remember when he washed our feet? How gross is that? In this whole upside down kingdom thing, Jesus, I don't know if I agree. I just don't know if that's a good idea. So I'm not sure. It says that they all worshipped him, but some doubted. I don't think they doubted that he had been was Messiah. I think they doubted the plan. And I got to be honest with you. That's right where I'm at. I I, I just want to publicly testify. Jesus has absolutely and radically changed my life. He he. I accepted Christ as a child. And he has been working on me uh, when I was a teenager then. I, I gave my whole life to him. I was sanctified. And God just filled me with his, with his Holy Spirit. And I said, God, every part of me is yours. And ever since then, God has been working, shining his light in all the dark places of my life. And i got to tell you, I am radically transformed by the power of God. Amen. There is no substitute this time, this time that my wife's been going through this physical thing, it's been a year now. i got to tell you, it's been really hard on our lives. So difficult. And there were times when I thought, God, I, where are you in the midst of this unnecessary pain? And why aren't you just healing my wife? We, you know, we've got hundreds of people praying for her and churches praying for her. And we're fasting and we're praying, God, where are you? And I've even thought, maybe, maybe this isn't worth it. Where are you, God? Anybody been there before? The pain is so deep. But I come back to, I don't know if it's Don or Angus this morning went in prayer, like, where would I go? Like, who else has the words of life? Who, who else has the power to transform my life from darkness into life? I mean... I don't doubt, in other words, I do not doubt the transformational power of God in my life. Amen. I really don't. But I do doubt the plan. Anybody, Amen. anybody just say, I'm with you. What do you think about what, God, what's going on up there? Hello? Do you see the needs around us? Do you see all of this? This is what the disciples are thinking and feeling. I got at Jesus, I don't doubt you at all. I, I have uh, reconnected with some friends in high school. We were Christians at the time. Uh, and now one of them is just like, whatever. <laughs> you know, he's, he's blown it all off. And the more I talk to him, the more I think to myself, he doesn't want to hear anything about my faith. I've got neighbors across the street. And they hear, and when people hear I'm a pastor, you can just see like the defenses go up. You're what? You're a Christian pastor? Whoa, whoa. And it just seems like out in the world, when I walk around, nobody wants to hear about Jesus anymore. They think I'm selling a pyramid scheme. They literally think I'm selling something. There are people even in my own family group, right? And it seems to me, and in my mind, it, it just it feels like they don't want to hear about Jesus anymore. They don't want me to talk about it. They don't want to talk about it. it. Like I said, the culture has changed. And I'm like, God, where are you in all this? Jesus' response to the disciples is really interesting, isn't it? Because I feel like God's not powerful. I feel like God's not effective. I feel like God's not in control. And what is Jesus' response to his disciples who are feeling those feelings? He says, All authority in heaven and on earth has already been given to me. Therefore go. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So he's saying to his disciples, you feel like there is a religious control in the Pharisees. You feel like there is a political control in Pilate. You feel like there is a military control with the Roman army. 
you feel like there is an economic control of this Roman global economy. You think all of that is power, and Jesus is like, it's not. It's temporary. It's futile. It is not effective in helping people with the needs they really have. He says, all authority, all the authority that matters, all the authority that matters, all the authority that makes a real difference, that's all mine. I got this. Everything you need, I've got. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go. I mean, I look around at my high school friend who I think, you know what, he probably doesn't want to hear anymore. I think about my neighbors, you know, that, you know they don't want to hear anymore. And I think about my even extended family members who are not following the Lord, and I think, you know, they don't want to hear about it. And what God is telling me, hey, hey, guess what? I'm already there. All authority in heaven and on earth, where it matters, has been given to me, therefore, go. There is this uh, theological principle that theologians look at, and it's consistently in Scripture, and it's called prevenient grace. And it's called grace that goes before we even know it. In other words, God has been working, God was working in my life when I was a baby, before I could recognize there even was a God. And this prevenient grace is what God is doing before people even know it. What I am being reminded of, and what Jesus is telling his disciples is, you think that all this political and economic and all this, all this uh, religious power, you think all of that is where the real power is. That's nothing compared to what God can do. And just because the world thinks all this stuff is so important, that doesn't mean that God thinks it's important. He says, where I'm really gifted, where I'm really interested, is in the human heart. That's where God does His special work. So Jesus says, I got everything you need. You know, the disciples were in much the same place that we feel. We're in a room where we feel like, oh, I just wish there was more people here. Because we want there to be like a, a momentum. We want it to be a, you know, this great, great crowd. And, and God's like, you know who I'll take to do this? I'll take the faithful. I'll even take you if you have a little doubt. I, your doubt is not too big for my power. And I want to work through that doubt. I don't want you to stay doubting forever. I heard a great sermon this morning about the purity of a mustard seed. Julio, it was a powerful message, brother, that a small, faithful faith is more important than a big, wishy-washy faith. <laughs> that spoke to me. What God is saying is, what Jesus is saying is to his disciples is this, go with the faith that you have, because it doesn't depend on you and your power and authority, it depends on mine. So go with that little bit of faith that you have. Make it pure and make it, make, it, make it purely about me and go and baptize. This is what he says. Baptize in the name of the what? In the name of Dave. Go out there in the name of Dave and go save people. Go out there in the name of Don. Go out there in the name of Julio. Is that what Jesus says? Go in the name of Peter. No, he says, go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Because God is already at work. And when we go, all we're doing is partnering with what God is already doing. I know in our board meeting last night we were making a list of things you know that we dreamed about for the future of our church, right? And it was a little overwhelming, I'm not gonna lie. It was a little overwhelming. And we did, we really landed at the end on if we're gonna see any of this truly impact the neighbors around us, we're gonna have to pray. 
And I think there was a realization last night, at least for me, I, if we're going in the name of Dave, we are doomed. <laughs> we are doomed. And just insert your name there, right? If we're going in the name of Don, we are doomed. No offense, brother. You're a powerful person. <laughs> but all we've got, all we've got is the one who's got all the authority, all the power given unto him. So we go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. What's interesting is how God sent his disciples to do what from this point? Where did, where did he tell them to go? He said go to, you know, all the places. But what was the first place he sent them to go? Yeah. Go pray. You need to go pray. And he's like, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And they're like, the what? The what? We're going to do what? We're going to go sit around and pray? That's what we're going to do? That's the action plan? And when the Holy Spirit showed up, now, God had, been, God had been in the preparation and the plan, right? They had been trained. They had been discipled. They had been walking around with Jesus while he taught and while he healed. And then he gave them stuff to do. There was three years of discipleship. So there wasn't a ground zero here. Three years of discipleship. And then he said, now in this season, you guys start praying. And you get together in one place and you pray. It's funny how they couldn't help but form a little committee in there too. You remember that part where they, you know, like, let's vote on a disciple. Anyway, so they couldn't help it. Anyway, and then it's like, <laughs> that's a whole other story. Anyway, so, but they get to this point where the Holy Spirit shows up in power. Tongues of fire drop. And all of a sudden they burst out into the streets because they can't help it. And what happens? The people who are lost, who had recently crucified Jesus and yelled for him to be crucified, now these disciples are standing up and they're speaking in languages that people can understand from other cultures. All of a sudden, this work of the Holy Spirit is drawing people together in ways they never could have imagined. All because of the power of the Holy Spirit. There's a missionary named Leslie Newbegin who wrote some great books. Uh, anybody read Leslie Newbegin? Oh, man. Missiologist, pastors in the room, you're in for a treat. Leslie Newbegin is his name. He was a, from England, sent as a missionary to India, worked there for decades. And when he came back, realized that the culture of England had changed. Sound familiar? It's exactly what we're going through. It's... <clears throat> Similar to what we're going through. Anyway, so he writes a lot about that. But he tells the story of being in India. And this ecclesia, this church leader, like a district superintendent, gets this letter, a random letter, from a remote tribe. And it says this, Will you please send a minister to baptize 21 families in our village? We all want to follow Christ. And he's like, Who? I've never been to this village. He looks out on a map. He gets out his notes. We don't have any missionaries around there at all. Where did this come from? So he decides to go up there himself and he figures out, well, and, and he asks him, he says, how did you come to know about Jesus? And he pieced together through all these stories that there were four things that happened. First off, there was a, an engineer that came through who was working on a part in the water well for the city. He was an American. And in the course of working, he told somebody he was a Christian. And then he left. And they noted, like, oh, a Christian? We've never met a Christian before. Well, he did a good job. He was nice, and he didn't rip us off. <laughs> That's what they thought. They didn't think much more of it. Then uh, one of the people from the village was in a larger city nearby, and they went by a bookstore, and they saw the Gospel of Mark. And they're like, oh, hey, that American was a Christian. This is from the Christian Bible. Maybe we'll read it. So a small group of people started reading through the book of Mark in this village. The next thing that happened was this fiery evangelist came through their village 
unannounced, uninvited, and stood up and started preaching about this gospel of Jesus. And then he left one of those little tracks and it said, if you were to die tonight, do you know where you would go? And they all thought, well, this is really serious. <laughs> so then they set off because the, the evangelist took off and left. So then they knew there was a Christian church in the city nearby, so they called the they sent somebody to go talk to somebody in, the, in, in that church. Will you come and teach us about Jesus? Because we, we've now three things have happened. So the church responds like, well, we're all busy. Well, we have this, this uh, ditch digger whose back is hurt, so he's unemployed. He can go tell you. So this ditch digger comes and spends uh, four weeks with, in this remote village uneducated, and at the end of that four weeks, the whole village, 21 families, decides we're turning our lives over to Jesus Christ. Now, in our board meeting yesterday, that was very similar to our plan. An engineer, a random book of Mark. <laughs> you, you see where I'm going with this? We're going to send in a fiery evangelist to just drop some tracks and leave. And then we're going to send in a ditch digger. Sound like a good plan? Can you imagine if we drew that up on a big, big whiteboard? This is our plan to reach this remote village. Anybody want to sign up to support that plan? Who was orchestrating reaching that remote village? Who has all the power and all the authority? Holy Spirit was working through different faithful people to accomplish the purpose of saving a lost tribe. Some of us in this room feel defeated. We feel doubtful. Some of us feel hopeless. Some of us feel disappointed because God has not shown up in the way that we wanted God to show up. I'll just put my name on that list. God, where are you in this season? Where are you? What's going on? I don't like this plan. I, where is everybody? And God wants to look at each and every one of us and just say, I got this. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given, Jesus says, to, to, to him. Now, go. Go in that authority. Not your own power. Not your own harebrained schemes. Not your, you know, don't try and figure it all out yourself, Dave. Just because you're a district superintendent doesn't mean you've got it all figured out all the time. You've got to go in my authority, not your own. Each and every one of us. We all go out, you know, we're in church, it's pretty easy to just say, oh, yeah, you know, thank you, Jesus, because we all know, like, man, I'm, I, without Jesus, I'm lost. I would imagine that's everybody in the room. But when we walk out of here, anybody with me here? We walk out of here, oh, I don't know if God's in charge out here. I don't know if God has authority and power out here. Do we act like God has all authority and power out there? I, what I have started to do, and I want to invite you all to do this with me. There's a, there's a spiritual practice that's called practicing the presence of Christ. Anybody heard of that? It's called practicing the presence. There's a, a very poor... A uh, Christian man named Brother Lawrence, about 1,800 years ago, 1,600 years ago, wrote this little book called Practicing the Presence. And what he decided to do was just take some time in his everyday life, in everything that he was doing, he was mostly a dishwasher. And as he was washing the dishes, he practiced the presence of God as he was doing what he was doing. Because God was with him. Right? Anybody sometimes like, I don't think God is with me while I'm doing this or doing that. 
I, I didn't, if, if you haven't done that in your life, I would encourage you to do that. But I want to push you just a little bit more. As you are at work, as you are at school, as you are with people, and in your mind there is this doubt that creeps in. Nobody wants to hear about Jesus anymore. God isn't active here. Everybody's rejecting God. What I would love for each and every one of us to do, myself included, is to practice the presence of Christ in that moment, in that place, with those people. Do you know what I mean by those people? You have people around you that you're like, they will never, ever, ever <laughs> want to hear anything about Jesus. What's fascinating is those are the exact people that may be that close. That close. It's shocking, actually. Those that seem the darkest sometimes are under the most conviction or under the most, like, they're this close to breaking. You know what I mean? So what I would love, what I think that God would invite us to do is, is it possible that we could practice the presence of Jesus with, did Jesus ever hang out with prostitutes? Did he ever hang out with tax collectors, people who are corrupt? Did Jesus ever hang out with the most broken and the poor? Did he hang out with the religious leaders who were broken? With the rich? There was nobody off limits to the presence and the power of Jesus. And yet when we walk out of here, we act as though he is not there. We think he's not there. Is Jesus with us right now? Is God bringing someone to mind in your life right now? He is to me. Someone that, that just acts like they don't want to hear a thing. They don't want to know anything about it. Don't talk to me about that anymore, Dave. Could it be that I could begin to just practice the presence of Christ there with them without even saying a word until, until the Holy Spirit makes it perfectly clear? So the Holy Spirit shows up and as I'm practicing the presence of Christ, now I'm not good at multitasking, but maybe you are, but I, this is what God's working in me. Practicing the presence of Christ with people who I think would never care, and think and practicing that presence while trying to carry on a conversation, <laughs> right? And not trying to force it, like in the power of Dave. You need to turn it over, right? I mean, like turning it into something it's, it shouldn't be. Waiting on the Holy Spirit in that moment, engaging with with these people, the, the people that need Jesus. Practicing the presence of Christ. Amen. I wonder how just recognizing Jesus' presence will change and turn that world upside down as we follow Christ together out in the world. I'll, I'll close with this. The Church of the Nazarene has a rich history. We're certainly not the only church in the world, right? Um, but we were, the Church of the Nazarene was born at a time when the, the, our country was completely divided, north and south. The north fought as the Union Army, and the south fought as the Confederate Army. And the whole country was just divided in half, not just geographically with a line, but they were divided politically, Union and Confederate. And can you imagine this? There was a war where thousands and thousands of people died in a war. And there was killing and bloodshed. And there was just all this division happening. It was brutal. People were traumatized. It's the only war that was ever fought in this country on this ground. And just imagine life right after that war is over how divided people would be. 
People were turning, men were completely broken, by the way. Men who had served in the war or around it. The men in our country were completely broken by that. And many turned to alcohol to just cope with life. So substance abuse, political division, war, PTSD, all of that. And guess what that ground was fertile soil for? That's when the Church of the Nazarene was born. We literally started by helping people who were broken by alcohol abuse and trauma and division. And our denomination was formed by different pockets of holiness Christianity from the north and the south joined together to become one church. So when we look out here and we just say the world's too broken, the world's too divided, nobody wants to hear about Christ anymore. Let me just remind you, this is the soil that the gospel grows in. God is already working there. God is already active in people's lives all around us. Let's commit to practicing the presence of Christ in the people all around us. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer? Oh God, I thank you so much for the great hope that you give us. We look around and we get discouraged. I want to take a moment, Lord, and I want to pray for the Vineyard Church in Yakima. I just got a, a small glimpse into a, a woman who's very discouraged this morning about her church being lost. And I could tell, Lord, that she was trying to figure out her place in the story of salvation in Yakima with a, with a church building that's boarded up. I pray that you'd, that you'd be with Elena right now, that you would help her. I pray for the Vineyard Church as they gather this morning in the YMCA that you would help them, Lord. I pray for Yakima Trinity Church. I'm grateful, Lord, for this location, for these people, for the children who are gathered next door. I'm just grateful, Lord, for all that you have done in this church and what you will do. And Lord, as we follow you, Will you give us more hope than we can muster up ourselves as we trust in your power and your authority that's all been given to you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.